1 Kings 2, King David goes the way of all the earth, and his chosen heir Solomon inherits the throne. But Adonijah, a very handsome man, and Solomon's older brother, has already set his sights on ruling Israel. There is much to say about Adonijah's subtle coup, which takes us back to Genesis, back to the Garden of Eden, to that old war between the serpent and the seed of the woman. But look here, where the text next gives us an intriguing set of details, where Solomon had a throne set for his mother, and she sat on his right. Some scholars seem to think this is a sign of Israel's participation in the cult of Asherah, the queen consort of the Sumerian god Anu. But as the text unfolds, an entirely different message appears, a message of hope through Bathsheba's right-hand place of honor. To understand this, we move ahead to a scene which unfolds a further nine chapters later. In 1 Kings 11, the prophet Ahijah finds Jeroboam, officer of King Solomon, on the road, and God says that both were alone in the field. Ahijah takes his new cloak and tears it into 12 pieces as a sign of God's wrath against Israel, whose eyes have turned to idols. Ten pieces he gives to Jeroboam, signaling he will be king over ten tribes of Israel. Two pieces remain, one for the priesthood and the other for Judah. So the people of God are torn into two, but God is perfect in his faithfulness, and one of his signs through Judah is women. In 1 Kings 14.21, we meet the first king of Judah, Rehoboam, son of Solomon. He does evil in the sight of the Lord. But notice how God records the name of his mother. After Rehoboam comes Abijam and Asa, whose mother's name was Makkah. Next in Judah is King Jehoshaphat, whose mother is Azuba. And we're off. God carries on recording other queen mothers of Judah. In all, the divine author gives us the names of all but two of the mothers of the kings of Judah, regardless of each king's character. And of Israel, no mother's names are mentioned, not for any of the 20 kings who ascend that throne. This is quite the contrast. And through this contrast, God communicates his great promise after mankind's fall into sin and suffering, that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. The true seed of the woman, our Savior Jesus Christ, does not arrive at the end of two kings as we know. God would bring that later. Yet even after his great coming, God would call our minds back to Bathsheba, back to the queen mothers of Judah, through the inclusion of women like Eunice and Lois, mother and grandmother of Timothy. In all these women, God is pulling on a thread in his story of our salvation, the female line that begins in the Garden of Eden and ends with the bride of Jesus Christ, his people, his church. Through women, God carries us to the end of time, to the wedding feast of the Lamb, and our home with our Savior.